Good morning and welcome to The Bridge. My name is Sarah and we are so glad to have you with us this morning. Here are your weekly announcements. Just a quick reminder, being courteous of others, remember to social distance. Before we get started this morning, we want to welcome our first time guest. We're so happy to have you with us and we know God's got something great in store for you this morning. Here at The Bridge, we want you to know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. If you haven't already, please feel free to fill out a Connect card. This helps us get to know you better. Once you fill out this Connect card, take it to the Welcome Center desk in the cafe and someone will be there to greet you with a small gift. Once again, thank you so much for being with us this morning. Today is the last day to sign up for small groups or grief share in the cafe. Remember, it's important for you to be connected in all seasons of your life, especially this fall. Once again, you can sign up in the cafe or online on the website. We are so excited to see what God has in store for us this fall. For you small group leaders, there is a meeting after church today back in the annex. Lunch will be provided and we're so excited to see you. Next week, come ready to receive communion. Here at The Bridge, anyone that desires to take communion is welcome to. We have a little bit different communion process than usual. This is what you need to know. You'll come into the lobby and see a sanitizing station and communion cups. Please sanitize your hands, take a single communion cup, and find a seat wherever you'd like. For those of you that are not coming to in-person services quite yet, we want to make communion available to you. Feel free to stop at the church, go in the front door, and you'll find the communion elements. Once again, remember to sanitize your hands, take the elements, and feel free to take at home. We're excited to take communion as a congregation again. Attention students, we've been working on some exciting changes for the junior high and high school youth ministries. Even though we don't have everything ironed out quite yet, here's a little bit about what to expect. First, the high school youth group will be moving to a small group format. Meetings will be held here at the church every Thursday evening starting at 7.30. Group offerings vary from an all guys group, all girls group, and a co-ed group. These groups will begin in September just like our adult small group schedule. Junior high youth will change to a monthly meeting. These meetings will start on the third Sunday of September from 6 to 7.30 and be on the third Sunday of the month moving forward. We're gonna kick things off with a back to school bash on August 29th, starting at 6 p.m. So again, hang tight. We are getting ready to relaunch student ministries here at the bridge. Today after service, we have several water baptisms. Feel free to stick around and celebrate this amazing event as we celebrate these individuals in our congregation. That is your weekly announcements. Once again, we're so happy to have you with us this morning. Now let's worship together. Good morning, Bridge of Hope family. Glad to see you this morning. Clap your hands. Come on, say hello to somebody. We're so glad that you're here. Turn around and say hello to somebody behind you. Man, let's all get in this morning. We're thankful that you're here and just we know that God's going to bless you this morning. Let's go to him in a word of prayer before we worship. Father, we thank you for today. Father, we thank you for your mercy that is brand new every day in our lives, Father. Lord, we need you this morning, Father. Inhabit our praises, Father. It's you that we're here to adore, Father. We love you. We need you. We thank you. In the name of your son, Jesus. And let's worship him, okay? He is worthy to praise.
lead us to the ones hurting around us. Let us be a light. Work through us, Father. So many hurting. So many that need you this morning, Father. Because we're nothing on our own, Father. We're weak people, and we need you this morning. Cover us with your blood, Jesus. Before we go, let's just be real with one another. How many today are, you're just being honest and say, man, I'm going through a trial and I would like to, for people to pray for me. Just raise your hand if that's you. Come on, raise it. I want you to look around. We're not going to touch each other. We're not going to put our hands on each other right now. We don't have to. We can pray for each other. If someone has their hand up, we're going to pray for you. Maybe if you're listening, watching online, and you've got your hand raised in your home, the Lord sees it. The Bible calls us to pray for one another, doesn't it? That's what we do. We pray for each other. We don't judge each other. We pray for each other. I don't know about you. I've been down. I've been in the valley. I've been, like, messed up. And I'm thankful that through 28 years of being a part of the Church of Jesus Christ, people didn't kick me when I was down. They prayed for me. They lifted me up in prayer. They continue to lift me up in prayer. And so that's what we do for one another. That's what, we're Christians, that's what we do. We pray for each other, amen? So again, real quick, raise your hand, that's you. We just wanna pray for you right now. Come on, just leave your hand up. Church, look around. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray for our brothers and sisters right now. Lord, that are going through a terrible time, a difficult season, a struggle of some sort, you know what it is. We pray for them. We stand in agreement today under the power and authority of Jesus Christ. We pray that you infuse them with fresh strength and courage give them wisdom, whatever it is they need today, we know that you have the answer. 
We pray for them. We pray that, Lord God, as they go through difficulty and trial, we're not asking you to take it away, but instead we're asking you to strengthen our brother, strengthen our sister, help them to come through the fire better, stronger, more like Jesus than they've ever been. We pray for them. Lord, if there's someone in this room dealing with sickness, we pray that you would heal their bodies. We pray that you would heal those that are sick among us and in our families today. For those that may be here this morning or watching online and they don't know you as Lord and Savior, we ask you to save them. We pray for our family members this morning that don't know Christ. Bring them to Jesus. Holy Spirit, open their eyes today. Open the eyes of Southeast Indiana all throughout the community. Our people, our people, our neighbors. This is our community that you've placed us in. And today, God of heaven, we ask you to pour out your spirit on Southeast Indiana. We pray that multitudes, many, many hundreds upon hundreds would come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. We pray for our school systems and our children and our families in this area. May you just begin to cover and protect and guide that Jesus would be glorified in all ways. Lord, today we stand under the authority that you've given us through Christ and we pray against the power of this virus and coronavirus and all of that. Let it just dry up and die. Let it get, just get out of this community that you would be glorified. We pray no one would die in Southeast Indiana. Lord, those that may get sick would just begin to heal and recover and that, Lord, this thing would just begin to dry up and die. You said if we would humble ourselves, turn from our own personal wickedness, call out upon your name, you would hear us and you would heal our land. And so this morning, God, collectively, we pray that you would heal Southeast Indiana for the glory and honor of your name. Have your way. God, all the requests spoken and unspoken that are being lifted up, we pray and ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And everyone said, Amen. Come on, give God praise. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Great to see everybody. Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it just like a refuge to come into the house of the Lord? All week, all the stuff that's going on, just the, the trials and the difficulties of everyday life, and then all the stuff that's going on in society and the world, to be able to come into the house of God and just worship the Lord. What a blessing that is. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 14, if you would. Luke chapter 14, uh, the title of the sermon this morning is Count the Cost. Luke chapter 14. I'll get there in just a moment. During the last um, few months, there's been a question that I've been pondering, just kind of each and every day, thinking about it, considering it. I'm sure many pastors are right now. And the question is this. It's the question that I want to present to you as the body of Christ because you're involved in this. And the question is, what is the church producing? It's a question that will kind of keep you up at night, you know, when you think about it. What are we producing? Are we producing consumers, selfish people, political people, angry people? Or are we creating people of character, people with integrity, people that love others? People that are compassionate and giving, dedicated people. What is coming out of the church? You know, if you're a business person and you start a business and you make something, widgets, whatever it is that you make, you produce a product. If you're a good business owner, a good business person, you'll always evaluate the product. What am I producing? Is it good? Is it, is it, is it solid, right? Today, that's big. We want something made in the USA something authentic, something that's going to last, something that's durable, all of that. That's what we look for, right, as in a product. And so although we're not producing widgets, not by any means, something far more important than that, we're, we are in charge, if you will, of spiritual development, spiritual growth, all of those things, people. That's the business of the church, right, if you think about it. And so the question has to be asked is what is coming out of the church? It's a very important question. It's a question that I believe that today God is very concerned about. He's, he's focused on, what is my church producing? 
In Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, before Jesus ascends to heaven, he says, go therefore and make disciples. Teach them to observe all of the things that I have commanded. You see, this is the mandate of Christ. It's the mandate given to the church. It's the same 2,000 years later. Today, the exact same mandate. So the question, the reality is, the real question that we should be asking is, are we producing, are we making disciples? Because at the end of the day, with all that goes on in the church, there's a lot of stuff that happens in church, religion, denominations, all of this stuff. There's a lot. And I'm not saying it's bad. Not at all. A lot of it's very, very good. But through all of that, the main thing, the thing that we've got to look at maybe the most, what's very, very important is are we doing what Jesus told us to do? Right before he ascends to the heaven, to the throne, he says to the church, make disciples and teach them. Teach them. Teach them the things that I've taught you. And so we have to ask ourselves that. I think now is a good time. It's a good season for the church in America, especially to ask ourselves that question. You see, Christianity is unique in a number of ways. First and foremost, it's unique because God sent his son to the earth. God came to earth and died for his people. That's what makes it the most unique. But it's also unique in that it's very radical in nature. Christianity is. It's very radical. Think about it. It's not about doctrinal positions. That's important, but that's not what it's all about. It's not about contemporary worship versus traditional worship. It's not about buildings. It's not even about how many people attend your services all of that, all of this stuff, do you sprinkle or do you dunk, whatever. The first and foremost, Christianity is about following Jesus and wanting to be like him. Whoa, that's what Christianity is, right? And that's what a, that's what a disciple is. A disciple is someone who follows Jesus and wants to be like him. You say, wait a minute, but he's not here, he's not on the earth. But, oh, he's left us everything we need to learn about him and to follow him. He's given us his word, so he shows us who he is, what he's like. He gives us a very clear example. And then he has given us the Holy Spirit so that we can do it. That's what a disciple does. A disciple is someone who learns from a teacher. They attach themselves to the teacher and they listen, and they observe, and they follow so that they can ultimately become like the teacher, so that they can learn the trade, if you will. And that's what you and I are called to be, and that's what we're called to produce. We can't forget today that Jesus Christ came to the earth, the Son of God came to the earth, and gave his life, shed his blood, and died for us so that you and I can be delivered from darkness. In other words, we're delivered from the world system. The world, the Bible tells us very clearly, is the system that is separate and apart from Christ. They're not interested in following Jesus. They're interested in all kinds of other stuff. But they're not interested in following Jesus. No, but you and I that have encountered Christ and have been born again, something's changed. We've been brought out of that darkness and we've brought into the marvelous light. Now we understand and recognize what our calling is. Right? We've been... The Holy Spirit has come upon us, and not only are we not in darkness any longer, but we've been made new creations through Christ. That's what the Bible says. New, different, distinct, other than the world. Right? We know that. This is very clear teaching in the Bible. It's really not debatable whatsoever. And we know that this is what we're called to. But here's what we sometimes forget. After coming out of darkness... And brought into the marvelous light and brought made into new creations. Here's what happens. We are called every day to live and be transformed more and more into the image of Jesus Christ. Did you know today that the one thing that God is probably the most concerned about on the earth. I don't know. I can't speak for God. I don't claim to. But I think from scripture we're safe to say this. What is God concerned about on the throne today? Is he looking down and worried about all the unrest and the pandemic and all of the stuff going on? He's not worried about that at all. I promise you. He's not concerned. He's not worried. It's all in his control. The Bible tells us that the, hand, the nations are in the hands of God. The hearts of kings and powers and authorities and principles, all in the hands of God. He's got all of it under control. I think the thing that God's concerned about today 
as he looks at the church is, are they being conformed more and more into the image of my son? You see, that's why Jesus came. He came to the earth so people could be brought out of darkness, made new creations, and then day by day, every day, week by week, hour by hour, as we live our lives through the power of the Holy Spirit, we become more and more like his son Jesus. That's what God's looking for. And so we got to ask the question, is that happening? Is that happening? Are we becoming more and more like Christ? That's what Christianity is. That's what God's looking for. He's not looking about anything else. How good do they sing? Oh, hey, guys, come over. Look at this. Look how great they sing. Look at this group. Man, they got all kinds of money in their church. They give to missions. This is great. No, 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 no. Those things are okay. They're fine. They're certainly not wrong. And they're good. But none of it matters if we're not becoming more like Christ. That's what God's after. That's what he's looking for. And so... The reality is it's something very strange. I want you to consider this. It's very strange and totally foreign to biblical Christianity for people to confess that they are followers of Christ but then live as though they are completely uninterested in being like him. Isn't that strange? Isn't it strange that Christianity many times in the West says, oh yes, I uh, believe Jesus, he's the son of God, I want him, I accept that. I don't want to be like him. I mean, I don't want to walk around like he did. I mean, after all, he took a beat down, he was innocently accused and didn't do anything, he blessed his enemies, he prayed for those who spoke against him, he had all the power of heaven, he could have just wiped out the earth, and instead of doing that, he loved those who didn't love him back. Come on. No, no, no. I don't want that. I just want this Jesus that I come and say a quick prayer. Preacher says, "Uh uh-huh. Everybody blesses me, tells me I'm great, and then I'm going to heaven. But let me just tell you, as your pastor, because I love you, that's a false religion. It's nowhere in the Bible. You hear me say that sometimes, right? Because it's important. I'm telling you, it's just important. It's where we are today. We have to get it clear. We have to understand what is true biblical Christianity. No, you can't say that you want Christ, but you're not interested in being like him. I don't want to live like he did. I don't want to treat others the way he did. I don't want to love the way he does. No, that's very strange. And let me just tell you, God doesn't honor it. I want you to read this in Luke chapter 14. Let's read it together. It's hard. I'll just give you a pre... You know, sometimes in Scripture... You know how sometimes there's some things on whatever, and maybe they show blood and guts and gore, and it's like this big warning and said, be careful, you know, you might want to watch this. Okay, let me give you a warning on this. Buckle up. Not me. Buckle up. This is the word of Jesus. Luke 14, 25. Great multitudes went with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise... Whosoever, you, whosoever or whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if the salt lost its, loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor for the dunghill, but men throw it out. He who has ears, let him hear. That's tough. Come on, real talk. That's hard. That's difficult. Like, that's hard to swallow. That's meat. Which the Bible says we should desire. We should desire the meat of the word so that we can grow thereby. Now, we're going to go through it. We're going to dissect it. But how many of you would agree this is, this is hard to swallow, at least as we look at it on the surface? So let's lay the backdrop. Here's what's going on. 
Jesus is going about now in his ministry, and he's already done a number of miracles. He's fed the 5,000, raised sick people out of their beds, all of this, cast out demons. And the Bible tells us in the very first verse of this reading, verse 25, that now there's just this great big crowd. This happened in a number of situations, and it's very unique. It's, it's very interesting because it's kind of contrary to the way we do church today in America. As the crowds would begin to build for Jesus, Jesus would preach the hardest messages. In another occasion, Jesus has a great deal of followers. He just got done feeding 5,000, and everybody's like, I'm on this dude's tip. I like this guy. He feeds people, gives you free lunch. He's the deal. He's the real deal. And so they're following him everywhere, and he just looks around, and the disciples are thinking, this is great. We're going to make money. They're going to come. They listen to us. They like us. This is amazing. We're gaining popularity. And then Jesus stops, turns around, gets everyone together. He says, hey, look, look, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have nothing to do with me. And the Bible says that immediately, right then, after that sermon, not many followed him. Isn't that strange? The, this, I can imagine it doesn't tell us in Scripture, but I bet that night, maybe around the fire, Peter's like, um, Jesus, could we talk? <laughs> like, can't you just tone it down a bit? Okay, so similar. That's exactly what's happening right here. Why is Jesus doing this? Does he not want followers? Is he trying to push people away? No, we know better than that. We know what the Scripture teaches. We know that God wants his house full. We know that the gospel is open to every person, whoever will, right? But make no mistake, there's an expectation for being a disciple of Christ. You see, Jesus discerned and was very clear. He wasn't impressed with the crowds, but he discerned. He knew that those that were following him, some of them just wanted more miracles. They were there for the show. Others heard that he fed hungry people. That's why they were there and they were hungry, some of them were just hoping that he was going to overthrow Rome. He was going to establish the throne of David. And so they're hoping to get a position of authority, right? And so he just cuts to the chase. And he says, look, I, I don't look. I know why you're following me, but it's not gonna do, that's not it. That's not why I came to the earth. I didn't come to establish some popular thing where all we try to do is put butts in the seat and that's it. And then we get great offerings and everything's wonderful and we tell each other we're great. That's not what I came to the earth for. I'm getting ready to die. I'm getting ready to get, I mean, just my back beat up and all of this stuff. I'm dying for your sins. I expect you to be separate and different than the world. You see, that's what the world does. The world is always looking for an avenue, an advantage for self, for self-preservation, for self-advancement. That's what the world system is. The Christian system, the system that Jesus came to establish, is the opposite. That system says you have to die to yourself. You have to die to yourself and your ambitions. So Jesus makes it very clear that when it comes to personal discipleship, he is far more interested in quality than he is in quantity. Now, let me ask, as we look over the Church of America, I'm thankful that this church is different. And I believe it is. We're still going to preach the truth, though. But as I look over the church in many aspects, in many ways, and if we're not careful, it will be us as well, we look for quantity. In other words, we're okay with being like a mile wide and like two inches deep. No, no, no. That's not what we're after, church. We're, we, look, we might only be a few feet wide, but we want to be six feet deep. We want to be deep. We want to be rooted. We want to be wise in our understanding of God's word, the heart of Christ, and our devotion to Jesus. Because here's why. Here's why this is so important. Because when things get difficult, depth and roots and foundation really matter. Come on, somebody. Isn't that right? In other words, when there's pressure from all sides, when things start happening in our society that we never thought would happen, when there begin to be attacks on levels that we never thought were possible, spiritual attacks, and we're just questioning and wondering what's going on, and the storms of life are raging and beating on us from all angles, and our children are going through difficulty, and our finances are suffering, and people are speaking evil against us, or whatever it may be, it's in those seasons of time that we need depth. 
We need depth. We need something more than just a superficial walk, some kind of confession that means nothing. We need depth. We need roots. We need to be fully rooted and grounded in Christ. And Jesus understands this. And so he says to us very clearly, this is what I'm after. This is what I'm after for you. Why? Because Jesus really cares about us. He's not concerned about crowds. He's not like we are. We're impressed. You know, look, boy, all these people here, they must like us. Oh, but in a moment, they'll just turn. Come on, you do one wrong thing, you say something out of the way, and then boom, they're gone. Jesus knew that. Now, let's break this down, because I want to get into another verse really quick, but I can't, we can't just leave this, because some of you right now are like, whoa, what is this? Verse 26. Come on, let's just do quickly. What's Jesus mean? So does Jesus want us to hate our people and our... No, 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 no. Here's the reality. Jesus is using an example of Hebrew hyperbole. He's emphasizing a subject, okay? You've got to understand that. Jesus, God the Father, is the creator of the family. Okay, come on. (laughs) He's not contradicting himself. But he's emphasizing something on like the highest possible level possible. And what he's saying is, if you're going to be my follower... If you're going to confess me as your savior and you're going to be my disciple, then I am calling you to radical allegiance. Folks, that's it today, this morning. That's the reality. If you want to be a follower of Jesus Christ, he expects radical allegiance to him. In other words, allegiance to Christ and no one else. No other cause, no other movement, no other political power, nothing else. Listen, that's why he uses the example that is the most easy for all of us to understand when he talks about fathers and mothers and sisters and brothers and even children and even your own life. He says, look, I got to have first place. I'm king. I'm Jesus. I'm the one that's dying for you. Here's the expectation. You have to, if you want to come to me, anyone can come. It doesn't matter. I don't care what you've done. I don't care how bad you've been. I don't care how much you've sinned. I don't care how dirty you are. I don't care how wretched you are. You could have blasphemed me for all your life. And then if you'll come to a place where you'll ask for forgiveness, I will forgive you. I will cleanse you. I will be merciful to you. But make no mistake, if you're going to follow me, I got to be number one. I'm number one. He's God. He has the right to say that. So he's speaking about a radical allegiance where he's teaching us that our love for Christ is to be so strong that other love interests are secondary. That's amazing. All earthly relationships are to be subordinate to our loyalty to Christ. That's hard, but that's the truth. That's what it means to be a disciple. Now, there's some great news, and we'll move on. In Matthew 19, 29, Jesus says, because Peter says to him, he's preaching this way still, and preaching about this devotion and being a disciple. And Peter says, look, God, look, hey, Jesus, we've done everything. We've sold everything. We've left our family. We've left everything for you. Why are you you getting on us? And Jesus says, no, okay, here's the deal. Everyone who has left houses and brothers and sisters or father and mother or wife or children or lands for my sake shall receive a hundredfold and shall inherit eternal life. So I want to give you some good news that is mingled in here. In other words, what Jesus is telling Peter is, listen, I get it, Peter. You're right. You are devoted to me and I will bless you. You, you're not your family life. Here's the reality. When you become a true, serious seeker of Christ, your marriage will get better, not worse. When you become a true, devoted disciple of Jesus, your relationship with your children will be stronger and better. You can be, the only way to be the best father is to be first a disciple of Jesus. If you want to be an amazing husband or wife, first be a disciple of Jesus. If you want to be good at your job in the co- as a co-worker, if you want to be good in the community and you want to have solid, strong, healthy, happy, fruitful relationships, first and foremost, self yourself completely to Christ because what he'll do is he will make you a loving spouse, a caring person, a kind individual, someone who's compassionate, no longer selfish, and now your relationships will thrive. That's what he's teaching. Come on, say amen. (laughs) Verse 27, he says, whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. 
To carry the cross simply means to identify with Christ. It means identification with Jesus. It's surrendering to God's will by dying to ourself. That's tough. That's hard. It's letting go of our plans and our ambitions, realizing and knowing that our God has something even better for us, that he really does order our steps and guide and direct our path. But guess what? If you, it's amazing how many people want God to direct our steps, order our path, but it's the path we've already laid out. In other words, it's like, look, I got this plan, and here's my steps. Here's what my order is. I'm going to do this and this and this and this. And so, Jesus, come on, come down, help me, bless this. And Jesus is like, what are you, that's strange to Jesus. No, 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 I've got a plan. Seek me. Come to me. Deny yourself. I've got something that's better than you. How many of us, how many of us suffer loss and live in lack because we are so identified with our self-image, our own future, our own idea, and God the Father is going, man, I, you can, that's fine, I'll let you. You're allowed because I'm God, and I'll allow you, but I have something so much better, so much bigger, so much greater than anything you could do in your own self. No, to take up the cross means we die to our ambition. And here's the hard one. We heard it the other day, I think. Maybe it was John Morgan who preached at our Connect conference. To take up the cross and follow Jesus means that your opinion dies as well. We're living now where opinion has become a God. That's what John Morgan said. I think he's right. Opinion has, like, that's the thing of the day, isn't it? But what happened to the old adage, everyone has an opinion and most of them stink? No, no, I missed it. Hang on. That's not even funny. You're laughing. It's not even funny. How about this? Let me fix it. Opinions are like trash cans. Everyone has one, and most of them stink. That's it. That's funny. Sorry. Just stop. I'm not a good joke teller. But isn't it true? Come on. We all do. We have opinions. And it doesn't mean you just, like, are this robot. and you know, But at the end of the day, at some point, you've got to set your opinion to the side. Gosh, I'm finding that like all for the last few months. Oh, oh, so tough. I'm talking to me. I'm being real. Isn't it hard right now to keep your opinion to yourself? But that's what it means to be a follower of Christ, denying yourself and taking up your cross. So then he goes on and he gives us three parables. He talks about a guy building a tower, a king fighting a war, and then salt losing its flavor. Now, let me give you this. The usual interpretation of this parable or these parables is that believers are represented by these folks, right? In other words, you better count the cost. Before you start on this journey, you don't want to start on this journey and then get in and be like, well, man, I didn't sign up for this, right? You, that's, he uses that even as an example. You don't want to start something and then not be able to finish it. And so most interpretations say that's what this parable is referring to. I think there's validity to that. I really do. I think there's some truth because scripture can have multiple meanings that are good. But I want to give you another thought. There's a man by the name of Campbell Morgan. He says this. He says the builder and the king actually represent Jesus. Not us, but Jesus. And he is the one counting the cost. In other words, he's looking out and he's evaluating to see whether we are the kind of material that he can use to build the church and to battle the enemy. Because he can't get the job done with half-hearted followers who, are not, who will not pay the price. The reason I think there's some validity in that interpretation is because he did it often when the crowds were following him. Just like what we read. Like, it's, I mean, it's going on. There's great multitudes. I, isn't that the end result we're looking for? Just people following us? People liking us on Facebook? People amening what we say? Coming to our church service and sitting in our seats? Isn't that the end result? I mean, if it is, he's got it. It's all figured out. We've got it taken care of. Just don't say, just now appease the people. Tell them what they want to hear. Make everything comfortable. And we've got it fixed. We got it. We got it. But Jesus doesn't do that. 
Why? Because he's evaluating the material. He's looking out, and Jesus had the ability to look through the facade and the fakeness of man and look into the heart of a person. And he knew that as he looked over the multitudes, there weren't really that many that were willing to do what he needed them to do. Do you think, by chance, maybe that's what's happening in the world today? As we're watching, things that maybe we never thought that could be shaken are being shaken? Could it be? I don't know. I'm not speaking prophetically. I'm not saying, thus saith the Lord. But I have to ask the question, could it be that God is using this season of time that we're in now to shake the church of Jesus Christ? Do you know that as I sit here today in churches across America, we are finding that somewhere between 35 and 40% of capacity is what's happening in churches? That's what's happening. And then they say, oh, we're watching online. No, they're not. No, we're not. We are just stroking our egos. People are not just in flocks and droves watching online, folks. People are not. Listen, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how you can live as a Christian and not have Christian interaction, fellowship, connection for months and months and months on end. Someone has to be the adult in the room and say, oh my, we have lost mass amounts of people from the church of Jesus Christ. And we just start worrying and what do we do and how do we fix it and how do we bring them back? But that's not what Jesus did. Come on, are you following where I'm thinking? I mean, I don't know. I'm just trying to follow what Jesus teaches. I'm just trying to say like, this is how he did it. There's a lot of things being shaken. And I think there's a lot of people looking like, I didn't sign up for that. I don't, this is not, I didn't, I don't carry the cross, die to self, eat flesh, drink blood, whatever. That's what they did in the times of Christ. And so it could be that the Lord is looking out over the earth today, seeking, who is it that's with me? Because, folks, I don't know about you, but I feel like we are, we are entering into the very last stages of human existence. I believe that. I believe it from a biblical standpoint. I believe that we are seeing the very last of the last days of time. And the Bible is very clear that before Jesus Christ returns to the earth, he will return for a bride, that's the church, that has prepared herself and has ordained herself, or, or, ordained herself and is ready, pure. That doesn't mean perfect, but it means devoted, dedicated, obedient, honoring Christ above everything else. That is the church that Jesus is going to return for. Are you following me? So something has to happen. Come on, I think we all know that. Something has to happen. And I'm just questioning, is it happening now? I thank God, before we move on, by the way, at this church, and I'm not bragging, it has nothing to do with me, it has to do with you. At this church, we're somewhere around 70 to 75% of people coming back to the house of God. And the others that aren't probably should not be. For those of you watching online that have comorbidities and you're elderly and worried, listen, we're not talking about you. We understand. And so if you start doing those numbers for this church, what I'm looking at, I think we have some disciples in the house. That's what I think. That's what I think. I mean, I don't know how else to explain it. I mean, you're not coming for the coffee. I mean, it's all right, but it's not great. It's not Duncan. I mean, really. And you're not coming because, like, you know you're going to get your ears tickled every week. I keep preaching, thinking how many more people can we offend. Lord, God, what are we doing here? Come on, somebody. Are you hearing me? And so I'm looking and I'm going, these people, they must love Jesus. They must love his word. They must be willing to set aside their own ambitions, their own desires, their own opinions. They're not being drawn in the fray and the fury of all the foolishness of the world. They love Christ. They're crucified with him. They're serving God. They're honoring him in their lives, in their towns, their talents, their treasures. That's what's happening. That's cool. But we've got to continue on, church. Turn to Luke chapter 6. I want you to see this, and we'll close in a moment. Luke chapter 6. Verse 27. Another warning, tough, 
hard to swallow. From Jesus. Luke 27, or Luke 6, verse 27. From the mouth of Christ, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who despitefully use you. To him who strikes you on the one cheek, offer the other also. And from him who takes away your cloak, do not hold your tunic either. Give to everyone who asks of you. And from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. And just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. But if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit is it? For even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back. But love your enemies, do good, and lend, hoping for nothing in return. And your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for He is kind to the unthankful and the evil. Therefore, be merciful, just as your father is merciful. What? Like, who signed up for this? I just want to go to church. Give me a 25, 30-minute service. Let me feel good about myself. Hopefully, it gets me through to next week, and then just get out of my business. Is that anywhere in the Bible? Like, does this even, come on, somebody, are you fine? Like, what is this? We got people permeating the church and they're coming in just to feel good about themselves. Listen, I don't want to stand at the day of judgment and say, when you look at me, say, I didn't tell you. I'm just telling you. I'm just giving you a warning. This American concept of the gospel, it's just a false, it's a false doctrine. It's a false gospel. It's not reality. No, if you want to show today that you are truly a Christian... If you want the fruit of that to begin to come out, you're someone that is full of the love of God. It's a new love. It's unlike anything in the world. Tell me today of all the voices that are clamoring for your attention, whether it's the Republican Party or the Democrat Party or whether it's media or social media, whether it's a sports team or whether it's a movement, Black Lives Matter, whatever the movement is. Tell me of a movement that speaks like this. None. None. No, this is different. This is unique. This is from the mouth of God. This is a higher calling. This is beyond the world system. Anybody can wear a t-shirt with a slogan on it. Come on, come on. Anybody can, you, anybody can get on social media, you know, you're a keyboard warrior. Anybody can do that. And that takes nothing. It takes no talent, takes no ability, takes no, nothing. It takes nothing. Anyone can do it. This takes the power of God. This says, wait a minute, I have something different. I have the Holy Spirit inside of me. Is it true? And it reveals to us we're full of the love of God. It's a new love. It's a love that's higher than that of the world. It's the love of Christ. It reveals that we follow the example of Jesus, not of anything else. We follow the example of Jesus. And yet today, sadly, many churchgoers are not identified with this type of living. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. No, no, not me. You say something to me? You put me down, you disagree with my camp, I will cut you, I will take your knees out, I will defend everything, to, I will fight to the end. Ooh, it's dangerous. I'm telling you, I, it's kind of funny until you stop and think about it, then it's dangerous. Dangerous. No, Jesus said... Love your enemies. Do good to those that hate you. Do good that think oppositely of the way you think. No, no, not me. Not today. No, today what we need, we need people to rise up. And you know what that is? You know what that means? That means you rise up and defend your position. 
But that's not what Jesus teaches. Look, I'm the, I'm the bad guy. I get it. I'm the one that has to get the message across. I'm just telling you what the book says. Let's read it again so we know it's from the book, not from Pastor Doug. But I say to you, this is Jesus. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who spitefully use you. Oh, but you don't understand what we need today. I am tired. I am so tired. I mean, I'm tired of a lot of things. I could rant and I could use this podium to just rant all day. But let me just share with you one thing that I'm tired about that you might not think. I am tired of people telling me what I should be doing as a pastor. I'm just going to be honest with you. We need more pastors that will get up in the pulpit and have some courage. We need some more pulpit pastors. They'll tell it the way it is. Listen to me. Let me speak to you as your spiritual leader and father. If you need me to tell you what you should believe and what you shouldn't, what group you should follow or shouldn't, what, what ballot you should vote on and not, you are in terrible trouble, and it means that I have completely done a disservice to you. I am not here to tell you who to vote for, who not to vote for, what group to follow, what group not to follow. I am here to teach you the whole counsel of God. And the reality is, if you know God and you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you and you know this book, it will become very easy that you don't vote for people who murder babies in the womb. You don't vote for people. You don't vote for people who do not support traditional family. You don't follow movements that undermine biblical principles that are very clear for even a child to understand. You do not need me to tell you that if I am teaching you and creating and, and making disciples in the house of God. Don't tell me what I need to do. What I need to do and what this church needs to do is make disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. Oh, no, pastor, you got to get up. You got to speak against Black Lives Matter. No, whatever. Are you kidding me? Oh, pastor, it's important now. I've had people tell me, oh, you got to be more political. We live in a district. Listen, come on. I, I'm a more political than you ever know. Do you know that in this district, in this district, in Ripley County, 99% of all voters vote Republican and you want me to take my pulpit time and tell you you should vote for Donald Trump? I mean, come on. What is it doing? Like, figure it out. I'm to teach you the principles of Christ. I'm to teach you to follow the example of Christ. Here's how we do it. Let me just give it to you as we get ready to close. No, our identity is not found in movements, in politics, in nationalities, all of this stuff. No, our identity is in Christ. We're not black, we're not white, we're not Hispanic. We are followers of Jesus Christ, new creations in Christ. We're not Democrat, we're not Republican, not first. No, first and foremost, we are followers of Christ. And the reality is, here is, the, here is the, well, pastor, what do we do? How do you deal with politics? Find out how Jesus dealt with politics and then do it the way he did it. How do I deal with social issues? Find out how Jesus did it and then you do it that way. How do I deal with government corruption? Find out what Jesus did and then follow his example. Just follow his example. You want me to get up and promote something? No, I refuse to promote it. I refuse to promote nothing but Christ and him glorified, him crucified, and that's it. <laughs> nothing else. Figure it out. This book is full. This is the problem. You say you're a disciple, but you don't know the book. You don't know the teachings. Well, I don't know what to do about this. There's so much government corruption. and I don't know what to do. Read the book. Learn a little bit of history. Just Google. You don't even have to like get a library. Just Google what was it like in the times of Jesus politically. That was, it'll, just do some research. Be a disciple. Learn of Christ. And then follow his example. That's it. Like it's not that terrible. It's hard to do. But it's not hard to understand. Is it? It's what Jesus taught us. He gave us the perfect 
example. He is the perfect example. That's why Paul came to his life, and this guy was a brilliant genius. I mean, he was a genius that could have done anything. But he came to the place in his life where he said, I live. But nevertheless, it's not I, but it's Christ who lives in me. That's what a disciple is. That's what a disciple does. And today, that's what, as a church, we need to be producing. We ourselves need to take the journey, as they come and sing, to be disciples. Day by day. It doesn't mean you're perfect. It doesn't mean you've arrived. In fact, it's a, it's a lifelong journey, isn't it? It's just lifelong learning more. I mean, like, it's easy for me to yell and be like Jesus, be like Jesus. That's true, but at the end of the day, it's like, that takes a lifetime. It just takes... Like, I'm still trying. I'm like, I'm nowhere even close to being like Jesus. I understand that. But that's my desire. That's what I'm trying to do. When I open this book, when I look at the world today, when I see all that's going on, the thing that's in my heart is like, Jesus, what should I do? How should I do this? How should I handle this? This person said this thing about me. This person's being rude to me. They're being obnoxious. How should I handle this? I know what I would like to do, but I've sold myself to you. I represent you now. How do you want me to handle this? Church, that's what we, it's imperative now. You're going to get swallowed up in all of the foolishness if you don't. Are you with me? You're going to get swallowed in the foolishness. Your emotions... Anger, all of this is going to take over if you're not careful. No, let's go back to God's word. Let's go back to the example of Christ. Let's let him show us and lead us and direct us. How do we deal with enemies? The Bible shows us. How do we do, deal with those who take from us and use us, speak evil against us? Jesus shows us. He tells us very clearly. But we need his help, don't we? Let's stand all over the building.